to today uh, session we will have a very interesting uh, session today and i would like to thank uh, the sponsor of this webinar novartis also i'd like to thank uh, saudi society of blood and marrow transplant uh, for uh, hosting this webinar and for inviting me and professor robert to uh, give the presentations today uh, we have a very distinguished speaker in the field uh, of the transplant today, uh, Professor Robert Dieser from Germany. Um, Professor Robert Dieser is a full professor of medicine and director of Division of Tumor Immunology at the Department of Hematology, Oncology and Stem Cell Transplantation at the Medical Center University of Freiburg in Freiburg, Germany. His work is divided into clinical responsibilities, uh, clinical and laboratory-based research and te teaching activities. Uh, Professor Zisser's uh, laboratory research is focused on graft-versus-host disease, tumor biology, in vivo imaging, and signaling. Uh, Professor Zisser has authored or co-authored more than 200 peer-reviewed uh, publications in many uh, journals, and uh, he wrote many uh, uh, book chapters. Uh, Professor Zisser is a sec section editor of Blood and an expert reviewer for research funding bodies in Germany, France, Israel, China, and Netherlands, Austria, Austria, uh, and the UK, Poland, Belgium, and Switzerland, as well as the European Union. He was also elected as deputy director of the Collaborative Research Center, SFP 850, and Director for, of the Division of Tumor Immunology at the University of Freiburg. Uh, so, uh, he, Professor Zisser, he has a special interest in the investigation and management of graft versus host disease. And he's going to talk today about how I treat uh, chronic uh, GVHD. Welcome, uh, Professor Zisser. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Dr. Sawani. Um, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to talk today here at the SSBMT meeting. Um, and the topic will be um, chronic um, graft versus host disease, um, a field um, that has uh, undergone major changes um, in recent years. This is my uh, disclaimer slide. So the clinical features of um, graft versus host disease, chronic graft versus host disease um, are um, very diverse. So you can have um, uh, systemic sclerodermic changes, as you can see here in panel A, this patient um, has a severe scleroderma uh, with fasciitis. Um, he stands, he leans forward um, because his skin is so hard that he can um, hardly flex his arms. Um, but this is only one type of manifestation. You can also have very localized manifestation of chronic um, GVHD, as you can see here. Um, in this patient, um, where you see in panel B, the arrow pointing towards a localized uh, chronic GVHD lesion. Chronic GVHD involves the mucous membranes. You see here the arrow pointing towards um, the gum of this patient. You see um, um, changes there, the esophagus, um, can be affected and patients have difficulty swallowing then. The nails can be affected, the eyes are affected by chronic GVHD, the lungs um, are involved um, and when you take a biopsy you find collagen and extracellular matrix deposition in the skin as you can see in panel H um, or panel I and the lungs can be infiltrated by um, lymphocytic infiltrates as you see here in panel J and K. So um, what is the uh, pathomechanism of chronic graft versus host disease? This is um, shown here in this um, uh, sketch. Um, it's divided into three phases, an early phase where um, danger signals are released such as ATP, uric acid, or others. And they lead to the activation um, of different types of immune cells, um, innate immune cells such as uh, monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, um, but also then at a later time point of T cells um, they, in the early phase, also cause uh, vascular um, damage, in particular endothelial cells are affected. In the second phase, then, those um, dendritic cells that have been activated prime B cells and T cells that then um, become um, effector T cells and, um, and memory B cells. The, um, this um, cannot be controlled because the cyme 
The thymus is also affected by coronary GPHD and the same injury leads to a disturbed positive and negative selection um, of T cells. In phase three then, the so-called effector phase, you have the release of uh, TGF beta or PDGF um, activating um, then um, fibroblasts and those fibroblasts produce extracellular matrix that then um, leads to the increased tissue stiffness as we have seen it in this um, patient. Um, CD4 cells um, support this process um, by uh, chronic inflammatory cytokine production, which also um, promotes tissue inflammation. Um, then um, B cells that have differentiated into plasma cells and produce immunoglobulins and the deposition of this immunoglobulin is um, first of all toxic and also leads to tissue damage and increases the tissue um, fibrosis. Um, so here you see um, the first line treatment that we um, recommend and um, there are uh, different levels of evidence for those treatments um, for uh, steroids as a dose between 0 0.5 and 1 milligram per kilogram body weight per day. There's very good evidence for that, grade A, evidence level um, um, 1. And here the reported um, CR uh, rates, response rates are between 30 to 50%. Um, there are other strategies where um, the corticosteroids are already combined with calcineurin inhibitors. The evidence here is less uh, good. Uh, evidence level 2, a very similar um, response rate. Um, it is um, such that patients with high-risk chronic GVHD um, have a um, dismal overall survival at three years, only 26% have been reported to be alive. And uh, when um, steroids are used as single agent, and the combination of steroids with um, calcineurin inhibitors, in particular cyclosporin A, um, increased the survival to 52%. Therefore, with high risk um, chronic GVHD, it is recommended to um, combine it with um, calcineurin inhibitors. In contrast, standard risk chronic GVHD, the addition of calcineurin inhibitors did not increase um, the survival, um, although it may reduce um, the risk for toxicity in those patients. The second line treatment is much uh, more difficult. Um, um, it is important um, to understand what are the criteria to start a second line treatment. And um, this is, um, for example, the um, progression while on pregnancy alone, um, a stable disease while on pregnancy alone for four to eight weeks, or the inability to taper um, the corticosteroids um, in these patients. Um, it is important when you add a drug to steroids to um, not to add uh, several drugs at a time, but to just um, add one drug at a time um, in order to be sure that the effect that you're seeing is related to this drug. Now we are coming to the different drugs. Um, I already introduced the calcineurin inhibitors. They interfere with calcineurin signaling, uh, which leads to dephosphorylation of NFAT. NFAT wouldn't um, translocate to the nucleus where it activates the transcription of cytokine genes. Um, then you have mTOR inhibitors that are used for chronic GVHD, such as serolimus or everolimus. They interfere with mTOR signaling and cell cycle progression. Anti-metabolites are being used, and I already talked about um, corticosteroids. So what are the commonly used treatment options for um, steroid refractory chronic graft versus host disease? Um, here, steroids, as I said, are important. Um, the safety, however, is a real problem. Osteoporosis, vascular necrosis, diabetes, high blood pressure, many, many side effects when they are given for a longer period of time. Uh, photophoresis has um, a good um, safety profile in contrast. None of those mentioned um, side effects. Um, it um, is used to reduce the use of steroids, but still it is not um, so effective that we would say um, it solves all the problems but it's an important um, cornerstone of the therapy for corticosteroid refractory chronic graft host disease. Uh, Calcineurin inhibitors um, have renal toxicity and cause hypertension. mTOR inhibitors are often used. They can lead to hematotoxicity and TMA um, with endothelial damage. MMF has been used. It has, however, GI toxicity and uh, causes infection and relapse. Eprotinib was um, FDA-approved um, for um, uh, systemic therapy in 2017 um, in the United States. 
It's not approved in Europe so far. It has um, causes hematotoxicity and hypertension, and the response rates um, are um, very variable, um, as reported um, in the literature. Um, these are other options. Metotrexate is being used, uh, hematinib um, to interfere with the signaling of the um, of the fibroblast that I'd um, shown you, rituximab to deplete the B cells that play a, um, play a role, pentostatin um, to um, cause um, um, immunosuppression. Um, other um, less frequently used um, interventions are cl uh, clofazepine, torco abdominal irradiation in really severe cases of fasciitis or hydroxychloroquine uh, chloroquine have been used. Uh, what are new targets in um, graft loss associated disease? So um, given that there is this early tissue damage, one could think about using inhibitors of um, purinergic signaling, um, P2X7 inhibitors, NARP3 inhibitors, ST2 inhibitors, to interfere early with the early events of chronic graft loss associated disease, um, interfering with uh, um, priming or the activation of um, B and T cells and amyloid cells with ITK inhibition or ROC inhibition is important, keratinocyte growth factor um, to um, normalize the thymic function is one option, um, then um, expansion of uh, regulatory T cells with low dose IL-2, JAK inhibition, I will come in more detail to that, interfering with uh, IL-6 receptor activation with tocilizumab, for example, um, pyrfinidone was reported, imatinib um, to inhibit kinases in the fibroblast is important, um, or bortezomib to interfere with immunoproteasome um, in plasma cells. So here are um, preclinical data, um, sorry, uh, from, um, for, um, uh, for oxalitinib for chronic GVHD, you see this, these are the lungs of um, animals treated with bone marrow transplantation only. Um, and you see when there are T cells added, then there is this deposition of collagen um, that leads to the lung stiffness. Um, and when you treat with oxalitinib, you have less, less of that. You see there's an improvement when uh, the mice are treated with Jarkavi. This is a preclinical evidence that um, chronic GDHD can be, um, can be improved. And uh, we have also a lot of uh, clinical evidence. May, uh, meanwhile, these are patients that have been heavily pretreated. Here you see the number of previous um, treatments before they received oxalitinib. Most patients had three prior therapies. You see here one example of a patient who had severe skin graft associated disease, uh, chronic GVHD, um, and um, improved after three weeks already. You see the response rates here, CR rates and um, PR rates that have been reported. Importantly, these are best um, response at any time point, so not at a certain um, given time point. Um, so now there are patients that um, are very refractory to many different interventions, and I would like to present you some data from the University of Freiburg, where we combined oxalitinib and ECP. You see a patient who had failed many different treatments with his chronic skin GVHD, who responded very well uh, with uh, to the ROX-ECP combination. This is before ruxolitinib, the gut was inflamed, and after Rux ECP that improved significantly. You see only 9% achieved a, a CR, but many patients achieved a, a partial remission. There were, of course, still some um, non-responders. Um, you see that um, different um, organs uh, responded, so in GI tract responded very well, in skin particularly. Um, time to response varied a lot. You have to have um, patience um, with um, the response rates because some patients need a lot of time. Um, this is time to response in weeks. Um, this is a steroid dose that those patients needed. You see in most patients, the steroid dose could be tapered um, after the combination of Rux and ECP. You see that um, before um, any treatment, the IL-2 receptor levels in the serum were high and with Rux they went down. But when um, we um, combined ruxolitinib with ECP, they further declined, showing that also ruxolitinib is effective. The combination may further reduce um, the inflammation in the body. This is the overall survival, which looked um, promising in those chronic GVHD patients. Um, and this is a time of uh, simultaneous treatment that varied depending on how fast the patient responded. Complication and side effects are shown in this table here. Um, there were patients who had um, CMV reactivation 
uh, they were around um, 37%. Um, patients had cytopenia, no patient had a relapse of the underlying malignancy. So in conclusion, our um, retrospective analysis showed that the overall survival with ECP and inhibition of JAK1 and 2 at 24 months was um, 81%. Um, that is a very good overall survival. Um, the overall response rate was um, 74%, 9% had a CR. And right now, a, a large uh, multicenter trial has been completed, the REACH uh, 3 trial, and this will be presented at the ASH meeting. Um, in this trial, oxalidinib was given compared to best available um, therapy. Our study indicated um, the combination of oxalidinib and ECB um, can lead to high overall, response, overall survival rate, a relatively little cytopenia in CMV reactivation, and some responses that go beyond the um, activity of um, oxalidinib um, alone. So with that, I'm at the end of my presentation. Um, I thank you for your attention, and I'll be very happy to take any questions. Thank you. A patient with the graft versus host disease, and uh, would like to discuss these cases and have your opinion uh, on how to manage them. So these are two cases from our center, uh, from King Abdulaziz Medical City, Riyadh National Guard Health Affairs. <clears throat> so the first case, sorry. Uh, this is a 20-year-old uh, female case of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. She was diagnosed in 2016. Uh, she underwent uh, allogenic stem cell transplant from match related donor uh, in CR2 uh, in October 2017. Uh, with uh, graft versus heart disease prophylaxis, was cyclosporine plus methotrexate. Uh, she discontinued cyclosporine early, less than two months uh, by herself. Maybe the treating team uh, were in support of that because she was considered high risk for disease uh, relapse. She was initially managed in another uh, center, and later on, she was referred to us uh, for treatment of chronic graft versus host disease. So five months post-transplant, she developed severe acute uh, GVHD involving skin and liver and responded to steroid and cyclosporine. Then she developed a chronic uh, graft versus host disease after taper of the steroid involving mouth, skin, and fascia. Uh, she was treated with bredinizone and ebrutinib with good response. This uh, up to uh, January 2020. Uh, bredinizone was uh, tapered and ebrutinib reduced because of high liver function uh, test, uh, high liver enzymes. After that, she had a progression of uh, chronic GVHD uh, with rechinoid and sclerotic uh, manifestations and mouth ulcers with severe restriction of movement uh, in elbows and ankles. Uh, she started, uh, she was started on bortezomib uh, and completed two cycles with partial response. Uh, this was up to March uh, 2020. Plus she was on bredinizone and the bretinob uh, low doses. Then she was referred to our center to consider ECB. Um, the ACB is available only in two uh, hospitals in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Riyadh. So she was referred to us uh, in May 2020 when we saw her initial uh, evaluation. Uh, her performance ac according to ECOG was two. Uh, skin assessment, uh, she scored three with more than 50% sclerotic, uh, deep, and impaired mobility, non benchable, and some erythema. Uh, in eyes, she scored one, mild dry eye symptoms. Mouth, she scored two, moderate uh, symptoms limiting oral intake. Lung scored two, FEV1 uh, was 40 to 50 percent. CT showed bilateral mosaic attenu attenuation of the lungs with multiple air throbbing. Joints and fascia scored two, with tightness of arms and joint contractures. The range of motion, shoulder uh, was six, elbow five, wrist five, ankle uh, two. This was according to the NIH scoring. 
So overall, severity was uh, severe with multi organs involvement. So patient uh, seen in our hospital and started on ECB. In addition, she was on prednisone. Uh, the dose was increased to 40 milligram every other day. She was also in a pretinib and she was receiving bortism from the other hospital. She was on other supportive uh, therapies, antimicrobial, plus uh, she, uh, she was on Simbicort and Mutilicast uh, for the lung uh, GVHD. So our plan uh, for the ACB, which was the fourth line here treatment, uh, we have like guidelines to start a uh, patient with chronic GVHD two sessions weekly for four weeks, then two sessions every other week and plan for five months, total 28 sessions. She showed excellent response in the first month with the skin became more benchable and lighter color with less erythema. However, um, treatment was interrupted after the fourth week. Uh, uh, of ECB by COVID infection. She got COVID-19 infection. She did not, uh, she required short hospitalization, but it was not uh, very uh, bad. Uh, so she ran, she, uh, she ran out of ECB for almost two months uh, due to resistant uh, positive uh, swab and slowly recovering symptoms. Then we saw here uh, after that, uh, again, uh, to restart ECB, we found that she progressed rapidly with more contractures and worsening uh, bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome symptoms. And here performance was uh, more impaired uh, where ECOG, ECOG was three. She's in wheelchair when she come to the clinic. She was restarted on ECB as a new patient, two sessions per week, weekly in July, then every two weeks. Uh, six weeks later, due to lack of response, uh, prednisone uh, dose was increased to 60 milligram. Um, we stopped ibrutinib and bortezomib, and roxolotinib was added, 10 milligram BID. ECB completed 18 sessions, completed since uh, July 2020. She has worsening of scleritic joint symptoms after three months of ECB and six weeks from adding roxolotinib. Though skin became softer and lighter at the forearms, face trunk uh, with growing hair and less erythema, no mouth or eye symptoms. So there was some improvement in the other systems, but the sclerotic features did not improve significantly with this combination. Her performance is uh, still uh, poor, uh, reaching four, range of mov movement, shoulder six, uh, uh, elbow, uh, from five to three wrist, uh, uh, five ankle, um, uh, uh, two, uh, two, three, and knee. Uh, now back to weekly ECB with Jacafi and tapering with the steroid now 30 milligram uh, daily. So we are doing more intensive uh, ECB sessions for here plus Jacafi, plus we start to taper uh, steroid. We thought she's a steroid refractory. So in summary, this is a 20-year-old female, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, three years post-matched related allogenic transplant. She has severe multi-system chronic GVHD, if the skin, fascia, lung, mouth, and eyes, multiple brief lines of GVHD therapies. Uh, she's on ECB, Jacafi, uh, prednisone, uh, with stable responses except progression of the sclerotic uh, features. So my question here, uh, Prof. Uh, Robert, um, uh, with this uh, cases, you may see these cases uh, rarely with multi-organ involvement uh, with hard uh, to respond to uh, available agents. So now for this patient, what do you recommend? ...situation because you have already used uh, the established therapies. Um, like Ibrutinib, uh, you have used uh, Jacabe, you have used ECP. Um, the the um, still remaining therapies are, for example, um, high-dose methotrexate. That are some patients respond to that. Um, in, if particularly sc the sclerotic features are a prob problem, there are reports in the literature um, where those patients have received. Uh, um, Toraco abdominal irradiation therapy um, to um, to basically to kill the fibroblasts that are so activated and cause the, the um, extracellular matrix deposition. 
Um, it's a very aggressive therapy, so to say, but if the quality of life is so bad, um, then she might benefit from that. Uh, a question is, um, how good is um, her um, hematopoietic system? Does she have normal um, platelet counts, normal hemoglobin and white blood count? Yeah, here uh, blood counts are, are acceptable. Good, because yeah. then this irradiation would be one option in this very refractory case. Um, another option would be to um, perform, um, to continue what you're doing right now, the ECP and the ruxolitinib, um, simply very intense, right? Like two sessions ECP. And as you said, um, it seems that she has a stable response. Only the sclerotic features are progressing. So if you would give her a metotrexate, for example, and see if that helps. And if that doesn't help, then perform this, um, this uh, Turaco abdominal radiation. I think this would be what I would probably do. There are also reports on IL-2, low-dose IL-2, that you could um, test in this patient. Um, has been described first um, by the group of Robert Seufer from Boston in the New England Journal. Uh, and they've shown uh, responses um, in the expansion of regulatory T cells. Um, this might be less toxic than uh, metotrexate and um, this toraco abdominal irradiation. Um, so if you have access to IL-2, um, this is one option that you could um, could also try. And this relatively young uh, woman, you don't want to give her too much irradiation and metotrexate, of course. Um, so probably the best way to proceed would be to try IL-2. Um, if that doesn't work, um, then um, metotrexate that doesn't work, then the irradiation. That would be what I would do. But I would also give the ECP and Jarkavi already um, a little bit more time. I'm not sure um, how long did she have this combination already? Uh, so uh, according to the presentation here, almost two months now. Two months. That is not very long for chronic GVHD. Um, I would give her another two months before you start a new intervention. Mm -hmm. Except, I mean, I cannot, I'm, I'm not the treating physician. So if you see her in front of you and it's very obvious that her um, sclerodermic features are progressing, then you have to react, of course. Then you cannot say we wait another two months. But from what I read here, um, I think another two months with this intensive combination therapy um, could be worthwhile um, before you start um, giving IL-2 metotrexate or irradiation. Yeah, IL-2, we try to bring it for another pediatric patient, but uh, we don't have access to it. Okay. So, um, yeah, maybe we'll continue with this combination, uh, roxolotinib uh, plus uh, ECB. Now, mm -hmm. for the high dose, for the methotrexate, what is the usual recommended dose uh, in this uh, scenario? Yeah, so it's very similar to uh, what is used in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, I have to look it up. It's not um, not like a chemotherapy. Like it's much lower than we use for chemotherapy. Um, I think it. I, I have to look it up. I'm I'm not sure. I have to look it up in the literature. Mm -hmm. And uh, both ECB and roxolitinib, uh, when you use them uh, separately, they are not very effective in the sclerotic type of chronic GVHD and. Uh, bronchitis uh, obliterans. So the combination from your study, it shows promising uh, effect when you combine yes. them together? Um, I agree with you that in particular um, bronchiolitis obliterans, it's very hard to treat um, with anything right now. Um, in, in, those, um, in this patient group that we treated with a combination, uh, we had um, a few patients with um, bronchiolitis obliterans that also improved um, under this treatment. But it took, I think, uh, four to six months until we found improved FEV1 in these patients. We have a question here from one of the attendees asking, uh, can we perform mm -hmm. another allo BMT as a management of refractory GVHD? Yes, that is something that has been discussed. I mean, it has a lot of toxicity, of course. Um, and of course, a new donor, um, so it was a match-related donor that you have here. Um, and uh, the question is, do you have another matched related donor? Because in match-related donors, you would already expect 
um, that the other reactivity is not so extremely high as compared to an unrelated donor, for example. But of course, this is an option um, and it has to be discussed, yes. Um, I don't know of data that is so successful, but what you could do maybe is to use post-transplant cyclophosphamide um, in the second transplant to reduce the alloreactivity. Um, I'm, I, I'm not aware of good data supporting these uh, second allo transplants for chronic GVHG because there is a lot of toxicity for a second transplant, right? And these patients, if she has already lung function problems, and so the second transplant can also be dangerous for her, right? If she then gets a, um, a pneumonia, for example, or an, another infection, she doesn't have so much potential to um, to survive that, right? Yes, yes. Another question regarding uh, the use of imitinib. Uh, sometimes we see it effective in sclerosis type of GVHD, and it was not used in this patient. Is it an option in this patient? So we have uh, treated a couple of patients with imatinib for sclerotic um, GVHD, and we have not had uh, good responses. We actually had, I think, zero response with imatinib alone. But there is a study where imatinib was combined with um, rituximab and rituximab to deplete the B cells. Um, and um, that had some activity. So that is something that one could think of in this patient. Um, combination therapy, I think imatinib alone is not strong enough. Um, but a combination maybe with, uh, with uh, uh, rituximab to deplete the B cells, um, there is data published on that combination. Okay, so uh, thank you. Um, we'll proceed to the second case, then we will go to more questions from the attendees. Okay. So this uh, case is 18 year old uh, male, case of T cell lymphoblastic lymphoma presented uh, with uh, lymphadenopathy and pleural effusion. She, he was treated with hypercephat for two cycles, then proceeded to match related donor allogenic stem cell transplant in November 2019, almost one year now. Conditioning was with CYTBI. GVHD prophylaxis was with methotrexate uh, plus cyclo, uh, cyclosporine. Uh, in our hospital, we give cyclosporine IV, and when we shift the patient uh, to oral, we shift him to uh, we shift them to tacrolimus. Uh, so he received tacrolimus for three months. Day 100 evaluation, patient was in CR, camerism 98% T-cell, 98% myeloid, and 98% whole. The patient planned to travel to Germany for second opinion, and we see this frequently in our patient after they got treatment. They seek uh, a travel abroad for just reassurance, um, and uh, they get approval from the government for most of the cases. So, um, Two weeks after stopping uh, uh, tacrolimus, he developed acute diarrhea. This was uh, exactly one week before his travel to Germany. Uh, when he was with us, we did the infectious uh, disease workup, and all was uh, negative. All CCMV was negative in the blood. Then he traveled uh, to Germany. Uh, this was uh, in the beginning of March. Um, he returned after two months uh, from Germany, and the report mentioned that uh, he had the biopsy uh, proven acute graft versus disease of the colon, and there was also an um, uh, element of uh, PTLD in the gut uh, with EBV reactivation. It was isolated to the gut, uh, the GVHD, so there was no liver or skin involvement. He was, he was managed with the prednisone uh, plus cyclosporine plus uh, rituximab. And he responded uh, to this combination. Uh, then after two months, he returned to us and upon arrival, he was on tapering uh, doses of prednisone plus uh, cyclosporine uh, 75 milligram BID. So uh, he was asymptomatic. We continued uh, tapering his uh, steroid and uh, kept the cyclosporine. Upon stopping prednisone, patient to started to develop oral lesions with signs typical for chronic GVHD with oral lichenoid changes, ulceration, erythema, and lips involvement with uh, start to have limitation of oral uh, intake. It was just uh, isolated to the mouth, no other organs involvement. 
So uh, according to the NIH score, uh, mouth grade two severity was moderate. So he was, uh, we reintroduced prednisone. He was already on cyclosporine and uh, we added uh, imatinib uh, for two months. Um, he had improvement, but we thought the improvement was mainly from the steroid because when he start tapering the steroid, uh, he has recurrence of oral symptoms. So uh, we stopped imatinib and uh, we uh, put him on aprotinib. He received aprotinib for three weeks However, he developed diarrhea and it was bloody, so uh, protein was stopped. Uh, then um, he, he was still having significant oral uh, GVHD. Uh, we introduced oxalotinib, 5 mg PID, and we increased the dose of the prednisone uh, to 1 mg per kg, plus he was in cyclosporine. Now he received this combination for two months. Uh, and he has a significant improvement, but not complete resolution. He is able now to eat and drink without difficulties. We start tapering uh, prednisone 0.5 milligram uh, per kg now, and he we increase the jacafi to 10 milligram BID. So summary of this case: 18 year old uh, male, T LBL 11 months uh, or almost one year post match related LOSCT. Uh, he had uh, acute lower GI GVHD for months post transplant resolved. Now he has chronic isolated mouth GVHD moderate on third line with a stable response. Uh, now, uh, do you have any question or what you suggest for this case, Prof? Is this common scenario to have like isolated uh, mouth uh, GVHD? Do you see this in practice? I think your microphone is muted. Can you unmute your microphone? It should be um, active now. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, super. So um, I think this is a particular case because it's called um, overlap syndrome, right? Because the acute GVHD didn't stop, it directly transformed into um, this chronic GVHD. And this overlap um, acute to chronic GVHD is particularly hard to treat. And we had similar patients who had isolated um, mouse GVHD, uh, GVHD um, that um, is very hard to treat and that um, takes a lot of time to respond. So um, this patient um, is uh, still on ruxolitinib. And I saw that while initially um, while initially, briefest slide. All right, yeah, it's still on Jakabi twice daily, right? Yeah. So um, it's good, and um, in this case, um, if the Jakabi is not sufficient for um, controlling the mouse GVHD, I would combine this with ECP. Um, since we had some patients that had um, uh, no response to Jakabi alone but then later responded to ECP in combination with uh, Jakavi. So that would be my first uh, suggestion. What we also have is um, that um, we have um, tacrolimus um, uh, ointment that you can put in the mouse, for example. Um, so there's, there's very little systemic effect. It's more like um, a foam that the patient can take in the mouse. Um, or we have these inhalers that are typically used um, for um, treating of um, uh, asthma and they have corticosteroids. So they are used and they are not inhaled, but instead just um, placed into the mouse um, uh, to control the mucositis. Um, these are measures that are relatively local um, if the patient has um, isolated mouse um, chronic GVHD. This can be yeah. a crisis. Um, and this is what apart we from that, I would use the combination. Yeah, this is what we tried with him uh, initially from okay. the beginning. But he's still on this uh, local uh, therapies, uh, dexamethasone mouthwash, I uh, see. tacrolimus uh, uh, cream. And we have okay. a very uh, good oral uh, medicine uh, mm. physician who has interest in managing mm. and seeing this patient. He gives also injections. So, But uh, it, it did not uh, completely help uh, him or resol resolve the, the, the mm. disease. 
So uh, the recommendation now is just to continue with Jakafi. Uh, should we table prednisone? Uh, I would prednisone and I would combine Jakafi with ECP in this patient mm. and give it a try and have initially a intensive ECP sessions um, and then see after three or four weeks if there's any evidence for a response. Now, if he has uh, improvement in his uh, oral GVT, but not complete resolution, when we examine him, he has still some inflammation, but he is able to tolerate that, he's able to uh, mm. eat and drink without difficulty. Can we continue with this, or we should we aim for complete resolution of the local inflammation also? There... So if, if, the, um, if there is not a complete resolution, but the patient can live with it, uh, we typically um, we typically wait simply. I have had patients who had severe mucositis that then got better under ruxolitinib, but the patient didn't receive a, a, achieve a complete remission. So we just waited and we continued with Jakavi and it took sometimes six months, but then the mucosid, mucositis was gone completely. Um, here I would just say we, you have to wait um, and uh, and try to get rid of the steroids. Okay, okay. Can I, um, can I ask a question, uh, Dr. Mohsen? Yeah, please, welcome. Yeah, um, very nice presentation. Thank you for both, actually, uh, speakers. Um, <clears throat> regarding roxolotinib, uh, Prof. Uh, Robert, do you, um, what do you think of, um, What's your experience of starting it as early as possible, as it takes a long time to see the response for roxolotinib? And you could, you could add to it, like uh, it, would be, uh, it would be an essential component of uh, GVHD, chronic GVHD in particular. Yeah. What do you think that? That's a very good point, and I believe that this will be the future. Um, right now, we had to wait until the patient becomes sterile refractory and to give it, um, but we all know that it's harder to treat something that is refractory rather than something that is um, still in under evolution. So um, I agree with you, it would be good to start as early as possible with the uh, oxolitinib, um, maybe even at the beginning when you have the first signs of uh, chronic GVHD that you directly combine the steroids uh, with oxolitinib and then see if you can imp uh, increase the response rate. It's a very good point um, in, for those patients who tolerate it, of course, um, from a hematological standpoint. Okay, thank you, Professor Zisar. We'll open that now, the Q&A session. Uh, so, okay, so, so the first uh, question, did you use imetinib on this patient? Imetinib is working very well in sclerosis. I think we answered this uh, question. There is a question, is there a definition for roxolitinib refractory? So for chronic GV, there is no definition so far. We, for acute um, uh, GVHD, we recently um, published a definition that says if there's no response within 10 days, uh, we call it roxolitinib refractory. Um, for chronic GVHD, you have certainly to wait much longer than this. Um, uh, you would have to wait probably um, um, two to three months until you can call it refractory if the patient is not responding. Um, if the patient is progressing on, during the um, treatment with roxolitinib, then you can call it immediately um, refractory, of course. Uh, we have another question by Dr. Basim Bayruti. What is the role of microbiota? and the prevention of GVHD and the internal environment and avoidance of certain antimicrobial prophylaxis? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, for acute GVHD that has been shown quite well, mainly by the group of Marcel Funenbring from the United States, and for chronic GVHD that is less evident. Um, uh, to be honest, I still try to avoid um, antimicrobial um, and uh, prophylaxis. We give no antibiotics as prophylaxis. Uh, we only treat when the patient has um, symptoms of infection. Um, the only prophylactic therapy that we are giving is uh, anti-herpes uh, anti, um, simplex virus and um, anti, um, 
um, pneumus cystis carinii prophylaxis. That the other, we don't give any other uh, prophylactic, uh, prophylactic antibiotics. Antifungal, do you give antifungal? Not as a prophylaxis, only when the patient has um, candida, for example, then we give fluconazole. Um, and uh, so when we treat the patient with that has high dose steroids, of course, uh, these patients then receive antifungal prophylaxis. Um, but post allo the standard is not to give antifungal prophylaxis. So is there any uh, duration of steroid where you should consider antifungal prophylaxis or doses? Yeah, so we give antifungal um, if we treat with uh, 15 milligrams for more than one week or higher. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you consider drug interaction when you select the, uh, the, the line of therapy for uh, GVHD, especially with antifungal? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there is probably deference um, of some of those um, as sole um, antifungal agents uh, with ruxolitinib levels. Um, so far, uh, we haven't taken that, we haven't reacted to that because um, there is no, not enough information on the pharmacodynamics, um, the pharmacokinetics of um, ruxolitinib during fungal um, antifungal therapy. Um, in the REACH2 trial, the first 30 patients uh, received pharmacokinetic analysis, and there was no evidence that these patients didn't re reach a therapeutic um, um, uh, level, so they all reached a therapeutic level, also they were on uh, posaconazole prophylaxis, the majority of those patients. Okay, we have another question also by Dr. Basim Beiruti. Is there any role for of infusing genetically modified donor cells in the management of donor-induced GVHD? Well, this is, um, this is certainly an interesting experimental um, strategy, and there are uh, trials um, using um, not genetically modified cells, but uh, donor cells like regulatory T cells or mesenchymal stroma cells uh, to treat um, chronic um, graft associated disease. Um, so far, um, these approaches have not been um, so um, successful that they have uh, entered clinical routine. Okay. <clears throat> we have a question by Dr. Ihab al Hamidi. What is the role of ibrutinib in chronic GVHD? Well, it's approved by the FDA, um, so it is used in the United States, but we we hardly use it in, in Germany. Um, um, I hear different things about it. Some uh, say that it has uh, activity, others uh, tell me that it has very little activity and that they are rather disappointed that, uh, that they are not using it so frequently. Um, it was approved based on a phase two trial um, uh, with very selected patients and with inflammatory chronic GVHD. Um, it has a lot of side effects, like in this one patient that you reported with a bloody diarrhea. So we, I heard about that too. So I'm using ipotinib for a mantle cell lymphoma, um, but for chronic GVHD, we are not using. It. We are very. I mean, we are not using it in in our institution. Other institutions don't use it. Um, so I think we need a phase three trial to show that it's superior to other uh, chronic GVHD agents. Yeah, we have one patient uh, who has a BOS refractory to multiple lines, and at the end she responded uh, to uh, ibrutinib. She was also okay. refractory to ECB. So okay, that's good. You don't know. I mean. Uh, how can we explain? I mean, some patient, uh, it is the same mechanism as the GVHD, but in one patient it will affect certain organs and other patient it will mm. affect other organs. And the same thing, the response to a different agent is uh, different from one patient to another. Is there any explanation for this? Yeah, so chronic GVHD is not one disease. It's a very heterogeneous um, disease. Um, in some patients, the fibrotic um, activity of the fibroblasts and macrophages is uh, uh, the main uh, activation. In other patients, um, it's more the T cell mediated and B cell mediated tissue destruction. Um, so it's probably a very heterogeneous disease. It's also many um, of those um, uh, pathogenic activities of the immune system play a role. 
um, they are different in different uh, chronic GVHD courses. Okay, we have a question by Professor Ahmed Alaskar. What do you think of using mesenchymal stem cells infusion and treating GVHD in general? There have been contradictory results from different trials. Um, so there were some reports in particular uh, from Sweden that showed very high activity of these MSCs, response rates around 80%. And then there were other trials who showed much lower um, response rates, uh, or almost no activity. Then there was this randomized um, placebo control trial, which uh, was negative, um, basically. Um, there might be different reasons um, for this trial to be negative, like the production of the MSCs was not homogeneous. The time bond of infusion was maybe too late. Um, so currently, um, I think MSCs have no proven role uh, for treating GVHD in general. Um, but there are um, ongoing trials and there will be one phase uh, three trial in Europe um, to prove or disprove the activity of MSCs in GVHD. Okay, um, the, another question. Uh, what will be the balance of control of the GVHD and prevention of disease relapse? When you have one case of severe GVHD, and then uh, the next patient you will give everything, but there should be a balance here because if you give too much immunosuppression, then you may have disease relapse. How will you balance uh, your management? Uh, that's a very good question because a little bit of chronic GVHD is also protecting from relapse um, that has been shown. So if we are too aggressive with our interventions, uh, the patient might lose this um, GVL effect and might relapse. So um, this is something that we should always keep in mind um, when we treat the patient also with steroids, which take away a lot of the GVL effect. Um, so as I would say, um, as much as needed, but as little as possible. Another question in this line, uh, did you see any cases of leukemia relapse with certain uh, novel agent? Like uh, there is reported cases of disease relapse with like, for example, uh, roxalitinib or imatinib. Do you see this in, in your study or? So in the, um, I can talk about the REACH2 trial um, where we saw that there was not an increase um, of relapse when you compare the two arms Oxalitinib versus the, the BAT arm. There were relapses in both arms and they were similar, basically. Hmm. Okay, uh, another question here by Dr. Bassam al Beiruti. How can we prevent CV reactivation uh, in every patient with GVHT receiving treatment? And do you monitor for CV uh, in patients with chronic GVHT uh, in immunosuppression? Yes, that's an important point also. So we monitor these patients very carefully and very frequently for um, CV reactivation by um, qPCR at least once a week if they are under high dose steroids. Um, and um, so what has been shown at least for the prevention um, in the first 100 day post allotransplant is that um, uh, Prevumis uh, or Letermovir um, is uh, preventing relapse or reducing the risk of um, CMV reactivation. So it's a good question. And it might be that when we um, give that to patients with chronic GVHD, uh, we might have less CMV reactivation. But this has to be investigated. This is just a speculation right now. Yeah. Uh, another question. Uh, would you vaccinate someone with chronic GVHD who is still on immunosuppressive medication? Uh, if so, which vaccine would you postpone apart from MMR? Good question. So if, if a patient is on uh, corticosteroids above um, 10 milligrams, I would not vaccinate because then the um, activity of the vaccination is probably very, very little. Um, I would rather wait until I, I can reduce the corticosteroids. Also, we know that these vaccine, uh, vaccines often have adjuvants that cause immune activation, and you might even trigger um, chronic GVHD. So if there's no urgent need, I would avoid that. What about the novel agents? You will avoid that also? Like uh, ruxolitinib, uh, imitinib? At least ruxolitinib, I would say, 
it is after all immunosuppressive and it will also probably interfere with a good uh, vaccination response. Is this applied for all types of vaccine like influenza, pneumococcal or? We don't, I mean, this is just speculation. We tested that um, systematically. Um, so it is more than experience and there's evidence uh, from preclinical models that um, ruxolitinib reduces the response to um, viral infection, in particular adenovirus. Um, so uh, probably there's also a reduction in the response to vaccination. Okay. We have five more minutes and we have two questions, if you don't mind, uh, Prof. Yes. So, so uh, how we, uh, a question mm -hmm. from Dr. Bassem, uh, how to explain GVHT and relapse at the same time? So there are T cells that have a T cell receptor that is specific for tissue specific antigens and those can cause graft versus host disease. And then there are T cells that have a T cell receptor that recognizes hematopoietic antigen and they normally control the leukemia. But if this population that controls the leukemia is gone, you can still have graft versus host disease, but no control of the leukemia anymore. So it is possible to have that. Uh, last question, do you, in your practice, avoid checkpoint inhibitors in someone with early signs of GVHD? Yes, so we have um, used um, checkpoint inhibitors for, for patients with relapse of AML um, in some patients and in some of them had a, a good response, but we never included patients who had um, signs of graft as a host disease. Um, we have seen cases um, reported by others uh, where the patients had developed terrible acute graft versus host disease um, and it has a high mortality to do that in those patients because you probably have a precursor frequency of T cells that are able to cause GVHD and when you take away their control as a checkpoint inhibitor you can risk you risk to have very severe acute GVHD. Okay. Uh, sorry, Prof, we have a question that we forget uh, mm -hmm. early, actually, by Dr. Maria Al-Mansouri. Uh, thank you. Is Roxolitinib ECB given, given same result and minimal side effect with LL condition regimen or with skeleton regimen? Yeah, it's, it's a good question, um, but we had only a very few patients, um, so uh, less than 30 patients, and we these patients were conditioned uh, very similar. They all had reduced intensity conditioning. Um, so we don't know if all conditioning regimens um, um, are uh, it's effective in all uh, conditioning regimens. It was a single center trial. It will soon appear in the bone marrow transplantation, so you can look it up. Um, but we cannot right now say that it works better in RIC versus myeloid Um At this point, it's too early to say that. Okay, with this, I think we will conclude the, the webinar today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Robert Zissel. It was very nice presentation and uh, uh, the question uh, session was also very interesting and very interactive. Thank you. Um, uh, I would like also to thank SSPMT for hosting the webinar and uh, the sponsor of today's webinar, uh, Novartis. And I would like to thank all uh, attendees. Um, uh, just a reminder for next week uh, webinar. Uh, we will have a presentation about how I treat EML incorporating MRD assessment by Professor Pau Montesian uh, from Spain. Uh, so at the same time next week on Saturday um, at 9 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It was a great honor. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.